in this big, loopy, fifth-grade handwriting. She talked like your teenage daughter, and, and all her senses filled with likes and you knows and I means. It was a calculated decision on John Ever, her agent's part, not to get a media coach, to let her personality show through. So you got this sort of uncensored stream of consciousness answers. She was fun to watch because she was always happy and, and giggling and uh, just killing everybody from the start. Three months after her debut, Capriati made the semifinals of her first Grand Slam event, the French Open. She struck the ball like a veteran, and she just had so much velocity on the ball and so much depth that she always played much older than, than she actually was. When she first came onto the scene, it really was all about how Stefano Capriati poured his life effort into creating this tennis player out of his daughter, Jennifer. Stefano was always not just her father, but her coach, her best friend, the person in whom she places the most trust. The feeling was about Stefano Capriati in the early years that he, you know, he wanted the best for his daughter, but that he was tremendously overbearing. Everything went through Stefano. He oversaw her tennis, as well as her endorsements, as well as all off-court activities, all in media interviews. Everything ran through him. Such control began early, almost from her birth to Stefano and Denise Capriati on Long Island, New York, March 29, 1976. Stefano is known for dangling a tennis ball over the crib, and Stefano is known for having Jennifer one month do sit-ups. He put her on a pillow and does these sit-ups, pulling her arms up gently and sending her back down again. And everybody said, what are you trying to do? He said, I'm going to make a tennis player. Jennifer started hitting tennis balls at three. Two years later, with the family living in Lauder Hill, Florida, Stefano delivered her to Chris Everett's tennis mentor, her father. Stefano brought Jennifer to me when she was five years old. I could see right away that she was an eager little kid with a lot of talent and that she was going to be lots of fun to work with. I like competing with other people and I, I like traveling all over the world and I like winning. In March of 1987, Jennifer appeared in Sports Illustrated's Faces in the Crowd, just as Chris had. A year later, the Capriottis moved to Haines City, Florida, so that Stefano could enroll his precocious daughter in the Greenleaf Resort Tennis Program. She was on the court with Tommy Ho, who was the best kid in the country, and she's like 11. And uh, I remember Tommy got a short ball one time, and Jennifer was at the net, and he just loaded up and just tattooed her right in the forehead. I thought it knocked her out. She just went like that and got in the ready position, and believe me, the next time she got a short ball, Tommy took off running to the parking lot. Before Jennifer ever even played a tour match, she was 13 years old. She represented the United States in what was called the Whiteman Cup, the United States against Great Britain. People knew Jennifer was for real when she beat Claire Wood, who was a British pro, love and love. And she said at the time, I'm not scared of anybody. I'm wondering if now they're starting to be scared of me. Fear was not a factor in 1990 when the women's tour not only adjusted its minimum age limit to allow Capriati to join its ranks three weeks before her 14th birthday, it also extended the number of tournaments she could play from 10 to 12. Certainly the Capriati rules were in effect. People looked the other way because uh, everyone felt that she could handle the pressure and people wanted her to handle the pressure. Everybody was talking about how many Grand Slams she was going to win. You know, I started something, and I think it did make it harder for the ones to follow because after that, everybody realized that a 14-year-old physically on the women's side is able to play against adult women. When Jennifer came up, there was a lot of talk about her freshness and her innocence and her enthusiasm, that this was going to be a contrast to the burnout that Tracy Austin and Andrea Yeager had suffered, that Jennifer is more physical and she had more assets and maybe the fact that she made so much money so quickly maybe that would even help her they shouldn't think that i'm gonna burn out just because they do because you know it's not my problem that they burned out so stefano kept saying jennifer is not tracy austin she's not andrea yeager he said she's jennifer judge her for what she's worth 
This was the man who took the WTA to task and said, if you don't let my daughter play, we will sue you. The Women's Tennis Association saw that you couldn't hold her back. And on one side, you know, people felt concern. On the other side, bring her along. Dollars, dollars, dollars. A child prodigy, a Mozart.